Okay, so let's start. Let's start. We want to start the, or we want to continue from where we left. We want to continue from where we left. Last time we were discussing or we were trying to do a question from your past papers. We were doing a question from the past papers and we had done the analysis of all the workings. You remember? We had done all the necessary workings for the purpose of preparing the question of cash flow. What was remaining was the preparation of the cash flow statement itself. And that's what we want to do now. So with that idea now, let's prepare our cash flow statement. Let's now prepare our statement. Let's prepare statement of cash flow. Statement of cash flows. And this question was asking us to use the indirect method. This question was asking us to use the indirect method. So we had done all the necessary workings. We had done all the necessary workings. So we shall be applying the workings as we go by. We shall be applying the workings as we go by. Remember, we said you always start with what we call cash flows from operating activities. We normally start with cash flows from operating activities. That's what we said. Okay. And when we take this category of the cash flows from operating activities using the indirect method, using the indirect method, you remember we said you always start with the profit before tax. That is a mark I told you one should never miss because it's something you just go and pick from the question. So let's go to the income statement and find out how much was the profit before tax for the group from the question sorry just a minute just a minute we pick from the question how much was the profit before tax okay yes so this was our income statement this was our income statement and from this income statement, we normally go and find out what is the profit before tax. And according to the income statement down there, I can see the profit before tax was 25.60. That is the profit before tax. That's what we normally pick. So bring it. That is 25.60. Then you know we normally adjust it, we normally adjust it with all the non-cash items. We normally adjust it with all the non-cash items. Listen, I hope you still remember we said, I hope you still remember we said, there are two non-cash items that will ever, ever be found in any question of cash flow. Whenever you are doing a question on cash flow, there is always two non-cash items that you will always find. And one of them is what we call depreciation. So we said you come and bring in depreciation charge for the year. I told you, listen, I told you for some questions, you have to calculate that charge. For some questions, it is given. For some questions, it is given. For these questions, if I think we were, no, I think we had to calculate it. Let me confirm from our workings where we analyzed the account of the property. It was the first, first one. Good. This was the question we were doing. That was question of November 2015. Question number three. You can see we analyzed the account of the property to help you get what we were calling the cash pay to acquire new ones. Then we analyzed the account called provision for depreciation there, and it was helping us to get this depreciation charge for the year. That's what we did. So now we, are give, uh, we have calculated the charge for the year. Now let's go use it. So that depreciation charge, we said some questions give it to you, some questions don't give it to you. And the amount we have seen there is 400 million. Our figures were in millions. Good. That's the depreciation charge. 
the other, listen, the other non-cash items that we said you must find in any question of cash flow is what we were calling finance cost. I am just picking them because I hope you still remember them. Finance cost. Whatever, listen, we said whatever you charged in the income statement as the charge for the year for finance cost, that amount we said is a non-cash item. We said is a non-cash item. So let's go to the income statement and pick the amount of the finance cost. If you look at this income statement, our finance cost is given as 600. Our finance cost is given as 600. We pick it. Good. That is the finance cost. Good. Okay, before we continue, let me talk to the new students because again, today, it's a free class. Today, I've made it a free class. So there could be some of you who have joined for the first time. Listen carefully. There could be some of you who have joined for the first time. So for, the fa for you now, as a new student, listen. First, I would ask you, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Below there, there is a subscription button. You can click it even as you are watching this. You can click that subscription button and also click the notification bell. So please subscribe. Even if you are a normal student and you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please subscribe. Just click on that subscription button below there so that you subscribe. Otherwise, what I wanted to say for the new students is this. Listen. As you are watching this class, sometimes your Wi-Fi strength may be weak and therefore you are disconnected. Once in a while, you may be disconnected. So the question is, how do you rejoin the class in case you are disconnected? If you click on the disconnected video, if you click on the disconnected video and it does not bring you back to class, then there are two other ways. There are two other ways to come back to class. One, you can refresh your page. On the top left or on the top right of the page where you're watching this video from, you may have a refresh button. If your gadget has a refresh button, then you can refresh that page. That will bring you back to class. If you have a refresh button, normally it appears something like this. It appears something like this, a refresh button. Alternatively, if your gadget does not have, whether it's a laptop or a phone, if it does not have, a refresh but have that refresh button, then you can go back to the group where the link was posted and click on the link again to join the class and click on the link again to join the class okay so that is just for the new students who are not aware of the mechanism that once in a while you may be disconnected because of your wi-fi strength being weak refresh the page or you go back to the group and click on the link again that is if you try to click the disconnected video and it doesn't bring you back to class once in a while sometimes it doesn't then i've also appealed to everybody please subscribe to my youtube channel if you have not subscribed, you can just click on the subscription button down there. Good. So let's go on now. Let's go on. So that is it. Okay. Now, I was saying this. When you are required to prepare cash flow statement using the indirect method, how do you determine the cash flows from operating activities? I have just said a short while ago, we always start with the profit before tax. That I have told you, never miss the mark for it because it's not something you have to calculate. You just pick it from the income statement. Two, I have said, once you have brought in the profit before tax, then I said you normally adjust it with all the non-cash items. This is not something new, I told you. It is something you did in financial accounting when you are doing section one, or you must have done it in financial reporting. You have to adjust the profit before tax with all non-cash items. I told you, in any question you ever did 
or you will ever do two of non-cash items will always always be there in any question one of them being the diption charge for the year if the question gives it to you pick it if it does not give it to you you must have calculated it you must have calculated it the second non-cash item is what we are calling finance cost that is something you just go pick from the income statement that the question has given you and you bring it to the group cash flow statement now listen for the other non-cash items you go back and look for them anywhere now you go back look for them anywhere from the question either from the income statement that the examiner has given to you or from the additional information look for any other non-cash transaction or non-cash item that's what we want to do so let's go back now where do we start you can start with the income statement that the examiner has given to you to get this 2560 profit before tax is there any non-cash item that is included in that income statement that's what i want to find out so we look at this income statement look at it now if you look at this income statement we have the sales cost of sales gross profit other incomes and among the other incomes we are given profit share in associate or share of profit in associate listen share of profit in associate according to this question it is an income of 160 listen did we receive 160 from our associate of course the answer is no i do hope you remember we said when we were analyzing associate as far as group is concerned we said the relationship between the group and its associate the relationship between the group and its associate when it comes to cash flows you remember we said one is required to calculate one is required to calculate what we called the cash dividend received from the associate then whatever is the cash dividend received from the associate we said that normally goes to the cash flow statement among the investing activities among the investing activities but it is obvious when you are a holding company listen when you are a holding company and you have an associate to consolidate with in the income statement i told you you normally go to the income statement of your associate you as a holding company and find out what is their profit after tax whatever is their profit after tax let us assume it's 100 million and i'm assuming you're controlling 40 percent of the associate you know from your consolidation knowledge that whenever you have an associate when you are consolidating it in the group p and L account you only take your share you only take your share from their PL account and your share of what of their profit after tax 40 percent of that which could be 40 million and you bring it to the group PL account listen that's how you consolidate an associate in the group PL account by bringing into the group your share of the profit after tax from the associate but the question is did you receive that 40 million no that 40 million is just a bookkeeping entry but as far as cash flows are concerned you remember we said what is involved in cash terms is the cash dividend is the cash dividend that you have received from your associate and that cash dividend we said is the one you take to the cash flow statement among the investing activities but listen to get this 2560 which we are calling profit before tax that profit before tax includes that 160 in our income statement but did we receive the 160 the answer is no that 160 was just a bookkeeping entry so from this question among other non-cash item there is that profit share from associate it is included in the 2560 but it is not 
something we received. So we bring it in and adjust. So come and see here, put it this way. Profit from associate, profit share, profit share from associate, profit share from associate, that 160. Do we add or do we subtract? Of course, listen, of course, you know it was added in the income statement. That means it was added to arrive at the 2560. It was added. But did we receive that 160? No. So what effect did it have on my profit? As far as cash flow is concerned, it made our profit more than it should be. And therefore you minus. It made our profit more than it should be. And therefore you minus. Good. So we have removed that. So let's go back to the income statement. I've told you. Listen. I've told you. The procedure is pick the profit before tax. Look for non-cash items. Two of them I've said don't think about them. They will be there. Depreciation finance cost. Then go back to the question. Looking for other non-cash items. Starting with the income statement that the examiner has given you. After you are through with the income statements, then go through the additional information. Looking for other non-cash items. Maybe there was a disposal somewhere which could have given a gain or loss on disposal. Whatever it is, look for all other non-cash items. So let's go back to the income statement and find out. To arrive at this 2516, is there any other non-cash item included? Good. That's what we want to check. So far, I have used that profit share from the associate, that 160. Now, if you look at that next item, listen, if you look at that next item, which they are calling investment income, investment income, we receive from our investment an amount of 200 million. I want you to listen carefully. We receive from our investments an amount of 200 million. Our investment was among the fixed assets in the balance sheet. Get the point? Our investments were among the fixed assets in the balance sheet. And I told you this. Any transaction affecting a fixed asset. Listen. Any transaction affecting a fixed asset, we said, it should be considered as a, an investing activity. It should be considered as an investing activity item. Now, if you remember our format of the cash flow, let me take you there so that I remind you where was that format. Let me look at that format. Where is it? Ah, here. When you look at the format of the cash flow, among the investing activities here, you can see now, I told you the last item here is what we are calling, the last item is what we are calling investment income. Meaning, listen, investment income is not, listen, investment income is not an operating activity item. It is an investing activity item. So from this question, we received from our investments that 200 million. It is part of the profit before tax. Get the point? It is part of the profit before tax. But what are we looking for? We are looking for the net cash flow from operating activity we are looking for cash flows from operating activity but within the 2560 that we are given as the profit before tax there is that 200 million which is an amount that should be classified as an investing activity listen i am not saying it's an uncash item no it's true we received 200 million from our investment but investing activities are those transactions that affect fixed assets. So we said 
when you purchase a fixed asset, I can even see it here. When we purchase a fixed asset, we say, uh, when you purchase investment, sorry, we say it's an investing activity. And when that investment that you have purchased gives you an income from that investment, that investment income, we said, should also be classified as an investing activity. Now, from this question that we are doing, we have in our income statement, we have our investment income of how much? 200 million. Get the point now? 200 million, it's part of, where is that amount? Yes, that 200 million is part of 2560. But the question is this, is this supposed to, as far as cash flow is concerned, listen, as far as cash flow is concerned, should it remain as part of the 2560? Because if we leave it there, then whatever we shall get down there, will include the 250 the 200 million yet we are saying that 200 million should be classified as investing but not operating now listen so that 200 we have listen that 200 we have there i am going to use it here listen carefully not because not because it is an uncash item it's true it's a cash item but I want to remove it from the operating. Get the point? I want to remove it from operating and take it to where it belongs. Where does it belong? It belongs to investing. So it's not that I am adjusting it here because it's an uncash item like the profit share, like the depreciation, like the finance cost. Those ones are an uncash item. Correct. But that 200 we received from our investment yes they treated it light in the income statement they added it it's okay but when it comes to cash flows what are we calculating we are calculating cash flows from operating activities and that income we receive from investments should be classified not as an operating activity item it should be classified as an investing activity item because it was received from investments. So the examiner for this question wanted you to reclassify the 200 so that you remove it. Listen, you remove it from operating and take it where it belongs. We are not removing it, I've told you. We are not removing it because it's an uncash item. No, I am reclassifying it. It's not supposed to remain as an operating activity item. I hope you are getting my point. It's not supposed to remain as an operating activity item. It should go to be classified as an investing. So come and say here, investment income, we come and remove it, you minus. Remember it was added to the 25, but we are saying it is not supposed to remain as an operating item. It's supposed to go to B. It's supposed to go to B, an investing activity item so that one i am adjusting it not because it's an uncash item get the point that's a point i'm trying to explain it's not because it's an uncash item no but i am adjusting it there because it is supposed to be classified as a finance as an investing activity so don't forget our procedure i say get the profit before tax find out non-cash items once you find them out, where do you get some of them? From the normal income statement that you are given, like I've done for finance costs, like I've done for the profit share from associate. Then I, once I am through, listen, once I am through with the items from the income statement, I go through the additional info information. So let's go back to the income statement and see whether we have picked up all the non-cash items. Good. So from this question, we have... Profit share from associate, that one we have done it. Below there, I can see distribution, admin, that's okay. I have picked the finance cost, that's okay. So it looks like from this income statement, listen, from this income statement, there were only two non-cash items. One is the finance cost and the profit share from the associate. But don't forget, 
I've adjusted the 200 pro, uh, investment income because, because it is not supposed to remain as an operating item good. So now that we are through, listen, now that we are through with the items from the income statement, now let's go back to the additional information looking for any other non-cash item. Listen, either it could have been given to you or it could have been required you calculate it whichever way. That's what we are trying to identify now. So let me go through the additional information now and look for any other non-cash items. Note number one, note number two, note number three, and so on. If we read note number one, it says, some item of machinery with an original cost of 680 million with a net book value of 360 million was sold for 256 million. Obvious, there was a disposal. There was a disposal. And that disposal could have given rise to either a gain on disposal or a loss on disposal. And I hope you can see, we sold an asset whose book value, book value was how much? 360. We sold it for how much? 256. So we sold it for less than its book value. That must be a loss on disposal. So we take that 360, we minus that 256. So come and see a loss on disposal. That is 360 minus 2 what? So come and see your loss on disposal. There is an uncashed item called loss on disposal. 360 minus 256. 360 minus 256 gives me a balance of how much? Gives me a balance of how much? What is our loss on disposal? It is 360 I minus. 256 and that gives me a loss of 104 you add that's a loss on disposal you add good that's all for that let's go back to the additional we are still looking for other non-cash items we are still looking for other non-cash items good so let's go through the additional we are looking for other non-cash items note number one I don't think it's there. Anything is there. We used note number one, you remember, to prepare an account called provision for depreciation, which we computed the depreciation. That's all for number one. Number two, they are saying, during the year, ended 31st of October 2015, Mawingo Group acquired 80% of the share capital of Mwewe Limited. The net assets of Mwewe Limited were as follows, as at the date of acquisition. Of course, there, there is nothing non-cash. There, there is nothing non-cash. So we leave it. We go to the next item from the additional. Is there any other non-cash item? Note number four, number three. The cost of property, plant, and equipment of Mwewe Limited on the date of acquisition was $800 million And the accumulated depreciation was $360 million. That is for the one of the subsidiary disposed don't for confuse that depression is not for the for the year no then we are told during the year ended 31st october 2015 there was a revolution gain there was a revolution gain of 8 million attributable to the company's property plant and equipment now some students listen yes there was a revolution gain of 80 million some students when i ask them give me other non-cash items they normally give me that revolution gain or revolution loss listen as much as it's true it's a revolution it's an uncash item the revolution gain or loss is an uncash item but don't forget we are trying to adjust this profit before tax with anything, listen, with anything that was used to get it, which is non-cash. But as much as it's true that you revalued your asset, maybe machinery, and you debited the asset by 8 million, that gain, you must have credited an account called revaluation reserve by 18. This revaluation reserve 
as much as it's a gain, it never went to the PL account. No, it goes direct to the balance sheet. It goes direct to the balance sheet. So as much as it's true, at the point, as much as it's true, a revaluation gain or loss is an uncash item. Don't use it when you are adjusting our profit before tax. Why? Because it did not go direct to the PL account. No. That gain or that loss goes to goes to an account called revaluation reserve. That revaluation reserve balance goes to the balance sheet straight as a component of equity. Good. So as much as it's true, revaluation is an uncash item. We don't use it among the uncash items in the cash flow statement. We don't use it. Why? Because it did not affect. It did not affect what I'm adjusting. I am adjusting the 2560 profit before tax. Good. We move on now. That's all for note number three. That's all for note number three, where we had a revolution. Yes. But is it an uncash item? Yes. Does it affect what I'm adjusting? No. As much as it's true, it's an uncash item. Number four. Number four says, other investments, other investments were sold. Other investments were sold for 240 million. Good. There's a disposal here. So when you sold an investment, again, you must have made a gain or loss. If I take you to the balance sheet, because that's where we did, if I take you to the balance sheet, and I told you there was no need of even opening the account, if you look at the balance sheet up there, if you look at this balance sheet up there, among the fixed assets, among the fixed assets, we had investment in 2014 of 200 million. This year, there was a dash, meaning we don't have it. That note number five says, we sold our investment for 240 million. So if it had a book value of 200 million and we sold it for 240 million, we must have sold it at a gain of 40. That gain, of course, being a gain on this person, it must have gone to the PL account. Good. So bring it to so come and say a profit. Profit on disposal of investment. Maybe you can even put it that way so that you remember what is it that gave us the profit. We sold an investment for 240 million at a time when the book value was 200. So that gave me a gain of 40 million. That gain, don't forget, must have gone to the PL account. It made my profit more. It made my profit more than it should be. So we come and minus. We come and minus. Good. So I'm hoping you're getting the concept on how to determine the cash flow from operating activities. Pick the profit before tax. Pick all the non-cash items from the question, whatever it is. Then we go back to the additional. We are still looking now for any other non-cash item. Don't forget we started with the income statement. From there we have gone to note number one, note number two, note number three. We are now at note number four. Let's go to number five and see whether there was anything affecting non-cash items. Anything affecting non-cash items. What about note number five? We are through with number four. Number five told us, the total purchase price of 80% shareholding in Mwewe was 360 million, which was paid by issuing 8 million shillings worth of shares at par and the balance being paid in cash. Of course, there is nothing non cash item there. It refers to you as a holding company acquiring a subsidiary. It refers to you as a holding company acquiring. A subsidiary that we shall deal with it later but it does not affect our operating activities get the point now so it looks like we are through it looks like now we are through with our operating activities we have picked the profit before tax i've told you adjust it with any non-cash items 
anything that was used to get it, which is non-cash. I told you, and I hope you have not forgotten, two of non-cash items will always be there in any question. One, depreciation charge. Two, finance cost. Those ones, you should not lose the marks for them. Then I've told you, go through the additional or go through the question, looking for other non-cash items. Where do you start? Start with the income statement. From that income statement, there could be some non-cash items. Listen, in other questions, even in the same income statement, you could see a profit on disposal, loss on disposal that is shown. You pick it. It's a non-cash item. And any other. From this question, we only pick two non-cash items. One is the finance cost. One of them was the finance cost. And two, the profit share from associate. Those were the only two that we picked from the income statement. Then I told you, as far as this income statement was concerned, we saw that the group has received an income from investment. That's who was a bit tricky. I told you, it's true, we received some income from investment. Is it cash we received? Yes, that's cash we received. But it was used to determine that profit before tax of 2560. But this income we are receiving from investment, when it comes to cash flows, where should it be classified? It should not be classified as an operating item. No. It should be classified as an investing activity item. I told you what are investing activities. Investing activities are any transactions affecting fixed assets. Any transaction that affects a fixed asset, that transaction should be classified as an investing activity. So from your investments, which are part of fixed assets, you received an income from your investment. So it should be accompanying where that investment falls. It's an investment income, sorry, it's an investment which is classified as an investing activity. Even the income should also be classified as an investing activity. So I had to deduct the 200 just because I want to reclassify it, not because it's an uncash item. Good. Once I, went through, once I was through with the income statement, I have now gone through the additional. From the additional, we have picked that loss on disposal from note one. And two, we have picked that gain on disposal of investment from note number Four. So it looks like I'm through now, so I can get the totals. And of course, I hope you remember when we were looking at the format, we said whatever you get here is what you call cash flow before. We said it's what you call cash flow before working capital changes. Cash flow before working capital changes. That's what we said you call it. Cash flow before working capital changes. Good. So let's get the total now. Let's get the total of the cash flow before working capital changes. That is 2560 plus 400 plus 600 minus 160 minus 200 plus 104. Yes, minus 40. I am getting a net of 32. If I'm correct, you'll confirm my figures. I'm getting a net of 32.64. 32.64. That's what I'm getting. Good. Then from there we said, adjust it now with the working capital items. Of course, for this question, we had to analyze the accounts, stocks, data, creditors, and so on. So let's go back to where we did the analysis of these working capital items now. We want to know whether there was an increase or decrease. Increase or decrease of those working capital items. And the first one we analyzed was stocks. Where did we get it here? You can see from the analysis of our stocks account, we got this amount of decrease of 16. Put it. So we come and see a decrease in decrease in inventory decrease in stocks let me just call it that way decrease in stocks that is 16. of course you know 
for stocks to go down, what must have happened? For stocks to go down, as a company, you must have sold. So that automatically represents an inflow. I hope you are getting. This is another area. Listen, this is another area I told you one should never, never fail. Getting the max for increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease. That one I told you somebody should never fail for those extra max. They are for free. Whether positive or negative, one should never confuse them. Good. After we analyze stocks, we must have analyzed data or what we could call trade receivables. So let's go back and check what did we get after we analyze stocks. What was the analysis of the data? Uh, good. I can see it here. When we analyzed the account of trade receivables, I can see we got an increase of 440. We got that increase of 440. Bring it. That's an increase in data. We come and see an increase in data. 440. Now, let me explain. Let me explain something there. Let me explain something there. When it comes to data and some other items of working capital, Sometimes, listen, sometimes, of course, you should know. Let me even start from there. From your accounting knowledge, when I say increase in data, should it be positive or negative? That is something you should know. But I'm trying to say it. The logic behind it is what I'm saying. The examiner doesn't care for now. But you should know whether this increase in data, am I going to put it as a positive or a negative? And if positive, why? Behind you, you should know. Or if a negative, why? You should know. Though the examiner for this cash flow question does not look for the reason, but you should know when you are asked, why are we adding? Why are we subtracting? You should be able to give the reason. For increase in data, the reasoning will take me a bit of time to explain, but I want to believe you are still remembering it from your normal accounting cash flows. You did cash flow in financial accounting, level one. You did cash flow in financial reporting. Now, if it was, listen, if it was a decrease in data, what could be the case? If it's a decrease in data, maybe data last year were 5 million. This year, data are 2 million. For data to go down, they must have paid us. That represents an inflow. That represents an inflow. Good. Now, for data to go up, we are saying it is the opposite. For data to go up, decrease in data is an inflow. That's positive. What about decrease is what we are saying is an inflow because data must have paid us. What about increase in data? Of course, it should be a negative. But I'm saying, if you know one side of the equation, the opposite of it is true. Well, we are saying if data went down, I must have received as a company. So the opposite is true. So when I know that the opposite is true, I just come and minus. But in true sense, I may not know the reasoning behind it. Why is it that we are minusing? Why is it that we are minusing? When data go down, no, when data increase, listen, when data increase, what could have happened? It is obvious, as a company, you sold more goods on credit. You sold more goods on credit. But don't forget, we are looking for cash flows from operating activities. When data go up, 
you must have sold more boots on credit on credit no cash was involved on credit but why are we subtracting yet no cash was going out when credit data has increased we minus yet no cash went out why are we subtracting that's what i'm saying listen the examiner will not ask you for that reason but if you know that data go down they are we are receiving cash then opposite is true you minus but behind you you should be able to explain to somebody why are we subtracting i'm not going to ask you to explain now but i am hoping that from your knowledge of cash flow you should know why are we deducting yet no cash went out don't forget we are determining cash flows from operating activities if there was a decrease in data then automatically i would have received cash there is no question that's an inflow just like i've told you when stocks go down you must have sold cash came in when stocks increase you must have purchased more cash went out but now we are seeing what in this case now of data increasing and yet we are putting it as a negative let me see somebody is trying to explain somebody the whole amount or the amount was sold is equivalent no 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 <laughs> no 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 okay i don't know whether to take a f one minute to explain the reasoning i don't know why whether to take a minute to explain the reasoning for the sake of your accounting knowledge not for the sake of the exam for your own accounting knowledge as an accountant because your junior might ask you why are we deducting and yet no cash went out why are we deducting yet no cash went out okay listen let me explain it <laughs> let me just explain it that's what i wanted to do this is your income statement of profit and loss listen carefully on the debit of your profit and loss we normally debit our expenditures and on the credit we normally put our incomes like sales now then the difference between the incomes and expenditures is what we call the net profit maybe before tax whatever it is let's say 20 million or 200 million but listen carefully now when you are preparing this income statement these sales that you brought in the p and l account are the total sales of the company that total sales include credit sales and cash sales so let us assume that out of the total sales 10 million shillings were goods sold on credit so if the sales here were 100 1000 million and don't forget when we are discussing cash flow from operating activities i told you when we were starting this topic we are looking for listen we are looking for what should have been the true profit if everything in the PL account was by cash we said what's cash flow from operating i told you cash flows from operating activities are those transactions that are used in the determination of profit those transactions that are used in the determination of profit those are the ones we classify as operating activities so when you sold goods on credit did you receive that amount of 10 million no but you used part of the 10 million as your sales yet we are seeing that the credit sales are a non-cash item so it is from the point of view of the credit sales that we are asking ourselves when you included 10 million as part of your sales 
those credit says what effect listen what effect did they have on your profit credit says are an uncash item so we are concluding our sales were overcasted from the cash point of view sales should have been 990 million from the cash point of view but we don't bring in only cash sales in the income statement. We bring in the total sales, which include also the credit sales. So this total sales that you brought in, because they include credit sales, and credit sales are an uncash item, that's why we are asking ourselves, what effect did they have on the profit? They made your profit more than it should be. The credit sales were added to sales. By adding them to sales, they made my profit more. So to determine the true profit, I should come and reduce that profit by 10. So the reason why we are deducting here is because this company must have sold some goods on credit. And when they sold the goods on credit, the credit sales were included as part of the sales including them as part of the sales we use the sales to determine this profit before tax 2516 but we to get it we used credit sales so for 14 million what effect did they have on profit they made the profit more than it should be that's why we are deducting cigar i hope you're okay now why is it that we are deducting it's because this credit sales were part of the sales and we are looking for the cash or the true profit listen how much should be the true profit if everything in the PL account was by cash that's what we are trying to look for the true profit from operating if everything in the PL account was cash now we are realizing there was a credit sales why because data are increasing for data to increase, there must have been a credit sales. And therefore, when you have credit sales, they are not things we received cash for. Yet we use them to determine to determine the profit. So when credit sales increase, it makes your profit more than it should be from the cash point of view. The other point. From the cash point of view good i hope you have got that one that the reason why we are deducting it's not because some students tell you that because goods went out we are not looking from the point of view of goods we are looking from the point of view of cash we are preparing a cash flow cash flow statement and we are looking for cash flows from operating activity as a one amount so we are saying this profit that you got, it includes credit sales. But we never received car credit sales. We received only cash sales. So adjust it with that credit sales. Listen, I don't know about creditors, but look at it also this way. If the creditors, look at it also this way. If creditors last year were 5 million, and this year the creditors are 3 million, then there was a decrease in creditors. There was a decrease in creditors. And when creditors go down, you must have paid. That's obvious. So that one, I would put it as an outflow. Don't write it, sir. If there was a decrease in creditors, it is obvious it's an outflow. But what if creditors last year were 5 million and this year the creditors are 13 million? A difference of 8 million. What could have happened? Again, for creditors to go up, your company must have purchased, purchased more goods on credit. So among the purchases that you debited here, whatever they are, there is an extra 8 million there, which is a credit purchase. But we did not pay anything for it. We included it as part of the purchases, which is okay. So these purchases that you brought in your income statement, they are partly cash purchases, 
and they are partly credit purchases. So if there was an increase in creditors, it means that we must have purchased more goods on credit. So this figure called purchases here, as far as, listen, as far as cash flows are concerned, that purchases is overcasted because it includes credit purchases. Now, that purchase being overcasted, it is the same as costs or expenses were overcasted. When expenses are overcasted, it's obvious profit is undercasted. Profit is undercasted. So if we had an increase in creditors, I don't know the question what we shall get. If we had an increase in creditors, I would come and say increase in creditors, I add. Because the creditors, the purchases, sorry, include credit purchases. Credit purchases being included as part of the purchases, and yet we never paid anything for credit purchases, then you ask yourself, what effect did the credit purchases have on profit from the cash point of view? The purchases were overcasted. It's the same as costs being overcasted. When expenses are overcasted, profit is undercasted. Therefore, to correct it, you add back. You add back. Good. But I was trying to say this. I've, I've explained the two that mostly confuse students. The creditors and the debtors. What is the position when debtors go up? You must have sold goods on credit. So when you ask students, they tell you stocks went out. That's why we are minusing. No, it's not because of stocks. We are adjusting our sales. The sales were including credit sales. So when credit sales were included, profit was overcasted. So you deduct. I've also told you, in case there was increase in creditors, you must have purchased goods on credit. Purchasing goods on credit, you included the credit purchases as part of the purchases. By including them as part of the purchases, you overcasted purchases, or in other words, you overcasted the expenses or costs. When costs are overcasted, profit is undercasted. You correct it by adding back. Good. So I've explained the two. But listen, I was trying to say in an exam, listen, that was my major aim. I was trying to say in the exam, the examiner will not ask you the reasoning. But I was saying, if you know one part of the equation, the opposite of it is true. In other words, if I know that creditors going down, I must have paid. That's an outflow. Then the reverse is true. It is a positive. I don't have to know how the reasoning is, or I don't have to remember. I've explained the reasoning, but I'm saying in an exam, you don't have to remember the reasoning. When you know, listen, that when data go down, cash must have come into the group because data must have paid us. That's an inflow. But when data go up, put it as a negative. You don't have to remember the reason, but I've explained it. Are you there? Good. So for exam purposes, the examiner doesn't ask you the reasoning. But now when you're in an office and you are asked by your junior, why are we adding increase in creditors? Why are we adding increase in creditors? It's because you must have purchased more goods on credit. The purchases were overcasted from the point of view of cash. By what? By the amount of the credit purchases. And when purchases are overcasted, it's the same as costs being overcasted and expenses being overcasted. That makes your profit to be undercasted. That's why we are adding. When your junior asks you, why are we deducting increase in debtors? Don't say it's because goods went out. No. We have said it's because you sold goods on credit. Credit sales were included as part of the sales. 
when you included them as part of the sales, your revenues were overcasted from the cash point of view. So revenues being overcasted, to correct them, you deduct. Good. So let's go on. I think I've explained that point. I think I've explained that point. Good. So let's go now to the next item. We are still analyzing the working capital items. We have analyzed the stocks. We have analyzed the data. I think the next one should be creditors now. Let's look for what happened. We must have prepared the account of creditors last time. We must have prepared the account of creditors last time. Yes, good. I can see it here. And what did we get? We got an increase of 24. We got an increase here of 24. So when there's an increase in creditors, what do we say? Let's first put it. So come and see your increase in creditors. 24. Obvious, I have told you, if you know one part of the equation, the rest, the opposite is true. I know that when creditors go down, I must have paid. That one I know, it's an outlaw. So this means when creditors go up, I add. I don't need to know the reason. Are you there? Good. <laughs> I hope you are getting that you don't have to know the reasoning. But I've already told you. Creditors must have been good. No, purchases were there. Credit purchases were increasing. Good. Okay, so from this question, listen. From this question, listen carefully. We have, I am through with the working capital items. Stocks, datas. That is from the current asset of your cash flow of your balance sheet listen from the current assets you can see here from your current assets you can see here we had inventories trade receivables i told you last time listen i told you last time that yes among the current assets we have financial assets that one i told you don't use it like increase decrease in current asset or finance Financial asset, no. I told you last time that financial assets are a part of what we call cash equivalent. I hope you still remember that. It's part of cash equivalent, and we say cash equivalent has its own place in the cash flow statement. So that one you know where we shall take it. Then next, we have cash in hand. That one you know, it has its own space for the, in the cash flow down 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 there so it's like i'm through i'm through with the working capital items concerning current assets what about the current liabilities if you look at the balance sheet down there among the current liabilities we have creditors or what they are calling trade payables that we have already analyzed accrued expenses that's why i'm coming back accrued expenses last year 200 this year 200 i told you last time that for that question or for that item we shall not need to analyze it because there was no change in their accrued expenses but what if listen what if last year their accrued expenses were 200 and maybe this year they are 180 what could have happened you must have paid for their accrued expenses and therefore you would come and say listen you would come and say decrease in accrued expenses they are part of working capital they are part of working capital that's the point i'm trying to say is only that for this question our crude expenses last year were 200 and at the same time this year it was another 200 so there was no change but in some questions you may have a change good fine so we are leaving it for now after Accrued expenses, what's the next one in the cash flow? In the balance sheet, we have bank overdraft. I told you, listen, bank overdraft, we don't use it as part of the working capital as increase, decrease. No, we told, I told you, but our bank overdraft should be considered as part of working, sorry, as part of cash equivalent. It is part of cash equivalent down there in the cash flow statement. Good. Taxation, 
It's obvious we must calculate the amount paid and you must have computed it. We must have calculated it. It has its own place for the tax paid. Good. Now listen. So it looks like I am through with the working capital items now. So I get the net. I am through with the working capital items now. I get the net. So I take that 3264 plus 16 minus 440. I add 24. According to me, I'm getting an amount of. Let me confirm. I. Oh, something is wrong. 3264 plus 16 minus 440 plus 24. I was getting a very low figure. Ah, good. Now it's, I think it's correct. It's 2864. 2864. That's what I'm now getting. 2864. Once I get that, I come and now see a tax paid. Tax paid is something we computed. So we just go to where we computed the amount of the tax paid. So let's go to where we did the analysis of the account called taxation. It was among the last last account to do the workings last time. And here it is. We can see that we paid taxes amounting to 1080, sorry. That's what we paid for taxes. So bring it. We paid taxes amounting to 10. 80. Bring it. Let's remove the tax of 1080. Then I get the net. Listen, I get the net. And I told you the net is what you consider to be the cash flow from operating activities. Listen, and I told you, you push it to the extreme. So that 2864, if I minus 1080, I'm remaining with 17. 84 1784 and being a positive we now call it net cash we now call it net cash inflow we now call it net cash inflow from operating activities net cash inflow from operating activities good now we can go to the second category now now we can go to the second category of the cash flows Good. So we come and see your cash flows from investing. Those ones, normally there are not many. Cash flows from investing activities. Let us identify our cash flows from investing activities. Where do we get them? Sometimes you pick them from the additional information. Good. We could even start with the additional. Let's start with the additional information from note number one, note number two. Is there an investing activity? I told you, listen, investing activities are those transactions that affect fixed assets. Good. From note number one, is there anything affecting it? Yes. Note number one, if you look at note number one, we are told, some item of machinery with an original cost of 680 million with a net book value of 360 million was sold for 256 million. So we have sale of machinery. That's in investing. So bring it. Sale of machinery. That's 256 million. That is obvious an inflow. That is obvious it's an inflow. Good. Next, we are still looking for any other non cash and other and investing activities. Any other investing activities. Listen, from the same note number one, look at it. From the same note number one, we prepared, listen, we prepared an account called property, plant, and equipment. They had given us the breakdown of the property, plant, and equipment amount. They gave us the cost, they gave us the depreciation and the book value. So you remember, we prepared the account of property, plant, and equipment. And I do hope you remember we said, listen, why do you normally need to analyze the account of property, plant, and equipment? For three reasons. One, you may not be given the depreciation charge for the year. Two, 
you may not be given the cash paid to acquire new ones. Three, you may not be given the book value of the asset disposed. So I remember when we were analyzing this question or this account of property, plant and equipment, it was our first account to analyze. We got an amount of the cash paid to acquire new ones. So let's go back to that account. It was, I think, the first one to analyze. Yes, you can see it here. We analyzed the account called property, plant and equipment here. And we got a balancing figure to represent the cash pay to acquire new ones. So let's use that as an investing activity. Let's use that as an investing activity. Purchase of property, plant and equipment. Good. So let's use it. Sorry. We want to use it as part of investing. Purchase of plant or PPE. We just come and see a purchase of PPE, property, plant and equipment. That's 800. That's an outflow. We are still looking for, listen, we are still looking for any other investing activities. Let's go to number three. Number two. Number one, there was a disposal. And two, we prepared the account called property, plant and equipment that was from note number one what about note two what was it about note number two and i want you to listen carefully there number two we acquired a subsidiary company we acquired a subsidiary company and i want you to listen something clearly there because i told you you invested by buying a subsidiary company you invested good and so we said among your investing activities don't write fast among your investing activities we said you shall have purchase of subsidiary i want you to listen carefully we said go find out from the question to buy this subsidiary company what is it that it costed you maybe Hope you remember we were saying to buy this subsidiary company maybe the question tells you you paid 500 million cash then i told you it's true you paid 500 million cash to buy the subsidiary but do you take that 500 million to the cash flow statement we said no we said go back to the list of the net assets that are coming in as a result of us acquiring this subsidiary company how much or what are the net assets coming in don't forget listen to kasema find out from the question among the assets coming in is there any cash that is coming in maybe yes listen let us assume 10 million and so we say if today i am buying your subsidiary and I'm paying you 500 million cash. And today, among the assets you are giving me, there is cash of 10 million. Then effectively, we said, effectively, I never paid you 500 million. No. I paid you how much? We said, you get what we call the net aggregate. The net aggregate cash outflow. So it means we said you take what came in, you minus what went out. I hope you remember that argument. What came in is how much? 10 million. We acquired a subsidiary. Among the assets coming in, there is that cash of five, one, 10 million. But you minus what went out, how much went out to acquire the subsidiary? I paid 500 million. So there is a net aggregate cash outflow of 490. Are you there? Good. Then we went further. Just to remind you, listen. What if I paid you 500? True. But among the assets and the liabilities you are giving me, there is that cash of 10 million and a bank overdraft of, let's say, 8 million. We say that an overdraft is a negative. I'm just reminding you because you never know in other questions. Good. The argument we say bank overdraft is still a cash equivalent. 
So today, I paid you 500 million. Among the things you are giving me, you are giving me two things. You are giving me cash of 10 million. At the same time, you are giving me an overdraft of 8 million. So effectively, what is it that I paid you? So we say it again, take what came in. What is it that came in? Cash of 10 million plus what else came in? An overdraft of 8 million. I told you that overdraft is a negative. Then I said, you minus what went out. Then get the equation balanced. Now we come and say, this will give me 10 positive and a negative. Positive and a negative, I told you it becomes a negative. So it will be negative 8. And I minus 500. So this will be 10 minus 508. And therefore you remain with a balance of 4 what? 490 what? If I minus 10 there, 98. Good. That's what we said you determine. So it is in the cash flow. Listen, in the cash flow statement, I told you do not take what you actually paid to acquire this subsidiary. No. Get what we called the net aggregate cash outflow. We are acquiring our subsidiary. What is it that we effectively paid out? Good. So with that idea now, I've reminded you, let's go and work out our question. From our question, you can remember, let's see, let me take you there. You can remember in our question, note number five. Note number five. Listen, we are told the total purchase price of the 80% shareholding in Mwewe Limited was 360 million. That was the purchase price. Which, listen, which was paid by issuing 8 million, 8 million worth of shares at par value with the balance being paid in cash. So to buy this subsidiary company, yes, it's costing me 360, but I'm not paying all that 360 in cash. Part of it, I paid it in shares. That is 80. So what is it that I paid in cash? I paid 360 minus 80. 360 minus 80. That looks like 280. That's what we paid here. Good. According to my illustration here, that's what we paid out. 280. 360 minus 80. But then, listen, we go back to the list. Yes, today I'm paying you 280 cash. But what is it that you are giving me? Good. So we go back to that note number two. From note number two, we realize among the assets coming in is what? If you look at this list, there was no cash. But I can see bank there. And I hope you can see bank is in bracket. Bank balance is in bracket meaning it's an overdraft. It is an overdraft. Are you there? Good. It is an overdraft. So, today I paid you 280, but among the things you're giving me is an overdraft. So, I take what came in, which is that negative 80. It's an overdraft. I take what came in. It's a negative. I minus what went out. That is 280. So effectively, what went out? Negative 80 came in, but I also paid you 280. That looks like a negative 360, which is the aggregate cash outflow. Listen. Listen carefully. For this question, for this question, what was the purchase price is the same as the net aggregate. But it is not always a must. The amount is amounting to the same because I purchased a subsidiary at a cost of 360. I paid 80 million of it in shares. But what is coming in is an 80 overdraft. That's why it looks like it's offsetting. Otherwise, if I paid 360 
but part of it in terms of shares 80 and maybe the overdraft that was coming in was 70 the answer would not be 360 no i hope you are getting good so, but for now it is amounting to the same as the purchase price but don't conclude that it should always be the same no so do this now put it we come and see a purchase of subsidiary take what came in how much negative 80 minus what went out how much negative 280 in cash i paid 280 in cash though the cost was 360 but in cash i paid 280 what is coming in an overdraft of 80 an overdraft is a negative so i still take it it's coming in i minus what went out that's negative 280 so you are remaining with a negative 360 good so that is the information that i needed you to get from note number two from note number two good we go to number three now we go to note number three we are still looking for investing activities good so note number two that's gone number three they are saying the cost of the property plant and equipment in Mueve limited was 800 million uh, accumulated depression of 320 all this note three listen all that note three if you remember we used it when we were analyzing the account of the property plant and equipment we used it when we were analyzing the account of the property plant and equipment so there is nothing there that is cash involved no instead we were putting all this information in the account called property plant and equipment which helped me to get the cash pay to acquire new ones so ideally note number three is gone number four is there anything yes number four we are saying we sold number four says other investments were sold for 240 million it was among the invest a fixed asset it's an investing activity we sold an investment which is a fixed asset good so come and bring it now and you see your sale of investment sale of investment sale of investment that is 240 we received that to 40 good that is from note number three number four sorry number five let's go to note number five number five the total purchase price i think that one you have already used it to get this 360. now listen we are still looking for i want to listen carefully we are still looking for investing activity items we are still looking for investing activity items what i have done i have analyzed the items from the additional information listen but that may not be all as far as identifying listen as far as identifying the investing activities are concerned no are there other investing activities that you could have it as done as a working or listen or you can pick from the income statement i have already explained one of them and that was the investment income i told you when we were doing the operating part of the cash flow here i told you this investment income should not be classified as an operating activity i told you it should be taken to the right place where it belongs and where does it belong it belongs to investing we received our investments our from our investments we received an investment income of that 200 so bring it in now bring it in now i am bringing it where it belongs to so come and see your investment income of 200 we are receiving it we are receiving it now we look for any other investment investing activity now let's go through a question again looking for any investing activities either as a working listen either as a working or we could pick direct now listen carefully bado how do you identify them we have said 
investing activities are those transactions investing activities listen are those transactions that affect fixed assets so you can go to the balance sheet look at what fixed assets we had and what effect did we have from this balance sheet look at the balance sheet i can see we have property plant and equipment that one we have already analyzed it it was helping me get what get the cash pay to acquire new ones then i can see intangible assets it's part of fixed assets what happened we analyzed the account called we analyzed the account called intangible assets what happened was there an impairment was there a purchase of an intangible asset that's what i want to confirm so let's go back and check when we were analyzing the account of intangible assets i think it was the third account here yeah, good i can see we analyzed the account of intangible and i can see we got a balancing figure to represent the cash paid to acquire new intangible assets i told you this could be patents copyrights trademarks and so on we acquired some more intangible assets good it's part of investing go bring it it's part of investing it's part of fixed assets that's what i'm trying to say good so come and see your purchase of intangible assets of intangible assets how much purchase of intangible assets 360 that's an outflow let me confirm i think it was 360 let me just confirm yes 360 good thank you good don't forget what we are trying to do listen what are we trying to do we are trying to look for uh, transactions affecting fixed assets I've gone through the additional. Now I'm saying sometimes there are others which could have either done as a working or whatever. How do you be able to know? By going through the balance sheet among the fixed assets, what was there. If you look at this balance sheet again, look at it. You look at this balance sheet. After the fixed assets called property and intangible assets, I can see investment in associate and i do remember listen we had to analyze the account called investment in associate for what purpose we had to analyze the account called investment in associate for what purpose to help us get what we were analyzing it to help us get what we were calling the cash dividend received from the associate and you remember we classified it as an investing activity where was it let's go back to where we did that working we analyzed the account called investment in associate where is it ah it's here and we can i can see when we were analyzing it we got it as a balancing figure here as the cash dividend received from the associate representing an amount of 40 million that is what we received from our associate of course don't forget listen associates are part of fixed assets i told you anything relating to fixed assets should be considered as investing activity now that we are receiving from our investment from our associate that dividend of 40 that should also be classified as an investing activity good let's bring it so we come and see a dividend received dividend received from associates that amount of 40 it's an inflow it is an inflow good next after associate is there anything in the balance sheet yes i can see other investments which we have already used last year it was 200 this year dash that means we sold it and i hope you remember we just used it a short while ago where we sold our investment here for how much 240 that's all listen so it looks like listen looks like i'm through with the analyzing of the fixed assets property we analyzed it it gave me cash pay to acquire new ones intangible 
We analyzed it. It helped me get the cash pay to acquire new ones. Investment in associate gave me a dividend received from the associate. Other investments, we sold it. Then we, we went through the additional and we picked the sale of property. We had to pick the purchase of subsidiary and the others. Good. So it looks like, listen, looks like I'm through with investing activities. So let's get the net. We push it to the extreme. Then we go to the last class of financing. So let's get the operating at the investing 256 plus, not plus, minus 800 minus 360 plus 240 plus 200 minus 360 plus 40. That gives me 784. I hope I'm right. Confirm my figures. I'm getting 784. Push it to the extreme. Push it to the extreme. 784. Good. And it looks like a negative. Put it in bracket. If it's a negative, what did we say you call it? We said you call it net cash outflow. Net cash outflow from investing activities. Net cash outflow from investing activities good so we are through with the second category now we can go to the third category and that is cash flow from financing activities those ones there are not many cash flow from financing those ones we can do them very fast normally there are not many cash flow from financing activities among the financing activities could be issue of shares, issue of debentures, and so on. Good. I do remember, listen carefully, I do remember we issued some shares. We prepared an account called share capital and share premium. And I do remember there was an issue of shares. So let's go to where we analyzed the account called share capital. When we were analyzing it last time, what did we get? Where is it? Hi. Where is the account called share capital? Ah, it's here. When we analyzed it, we got a balance of 400 million to be the cash received from the issue of shares. That's where we got it. Bring it. That's 400. After that, listen carefully again, listen carefully. Cash flow from financing activities affect the finances. So if I want to know which other finances were there, I just go to the balance sheet. Check among the finances in terms of equity and the long-term liabilities. Good. Let me confirm. If I look at this balance sheet, among the equities, when you share capital and premium, that's okay. Then there is that debenture are you seeing the debenture there yes so let's go to where we analyzed the account of debenture i remember we had to analyze the account of debenture also somewhere i remember the subsidiary that was coming in good it's here i can see the debenture account we got a balancing figure of 640 meaning we must have issued some more debentures we analyzed that account so let's bring it in now. So come and see your issue of debentures. 640. Issue of debentures, 640. Listen. Listen carefully. I told you. I want you to listen. I told you. Normally, 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 the major finances are shares debentures and maybe loans from this question in our balance sheet we did not have a loan no those were the major finances listen carefully then i told you once you're through with the major finances you have to pay the, these financiers their return you have to pay them their return and what are their returns i told you to the shareholders 
we normally pay them what? Dividends. So you come and see here, dividends paid. I also hope you remember, we say, listen, when it comes to group cash flow statement, there are two categories of dividends. What we pay to the group members and what we pay to the non-controlling interest. Those are the two types of shareholders we had. The group members and the non-controlling shareholders. Both of these figures, we calculated them last time. So let's go to where we did the calculations. Let's go to where we did the calculations. Ah, good. I can even see one here. Dividends paid to group members. I can see we had to work backwards. Good. Here it is. We had to work backwards, if you remember. And we got an amount of the dividends paid to group members as 888 million. Let's use it. That's what we paid to the group members. 888 million. You minus. Then you go find out what about to the non-controlling shareholders. What about to the non-controlling shareholders. Good. Listen. We prepared the account called non-controlling interest. Where is this account? We prepared an account called non-controlling interest. Where was it? Ah, here. We got a balancing figure of 40. This amount we paid as dividends to the non-controlling shareholders. Good. Bring it. 40. Once you have paid the shareholders their return, we have debenture holders. Listen, we have debenture holders. And that's what we called interest paid. Interest paid. I want you to listen to that carefully again. I want you to listen to that one carefully. It's not something new for this one. But I just want to remind you. I want to remind you. I want to remind you, listen. When we were given the p account, you remember we saw there was a finance cost of how much. And I hope you remember this is not something new. Let me just remind you what you did in financial accounting. You see here, the finance cost was 600. From this balance sheet, listen carefully, from this balance sheet, there was nowhere we came across accrued interest. No. In other words, there was no liability for interest in the balance sheet. That tells me what? If, listen carefully, if during the year we charged, we charged 600 in the income statement, which we did, and by the end of the year, we owe nobody for that interest. According to the balance sheet, there was no interest owing. In some questions, there could be interest owing. There are some questions that have interest by the end of the year. Listen, if there was interest by the end of the year, just like you computed the amount of the tax paid, you also calculate the interest paid. How? I would have opened the account called interest. I would have brought down the interest owing by end of last year, maybe 10. I would have gone to the income statement just like we did for tax. Pick the charge for the year. I come and see a 600. Then I go to the balance sheet by end of the year, carry down the balance by the end of the year for interest, maybe five. Then I get the balancing figure, and that will be the cash paid. This will be 610, 610. That will mean I paid 605. Listen, that's what I would have done. If there was an accrued interest by end of the year in the balance sheet, I would bring down the interest owing from the balance sheet last year. I would go to the income statement, pick the charge for the year, 600. Then I would carry down the interest owing by the end of the year, which I'm assuming to be five. Then the balancing figure is what you would have paid. Listen, but as per this question, I hope you are following, as per this question, we had no interest owing. Let me put a dash now. Then you go to the income statement. Pick the charge for the year, 600. 
Then go to the balance sheet. See what you are cutting down again for this question. Nothing. We put a dash. So what does it mean? Again, this is 600. This should be 600. You must have paid 600. So what I'm trying to say is this. That when you don't have any accrued interest at the end of the year in the balance sheet, then it implies that what was the charge for the year in the income statement must have been exactly what you paid during the year. I hope you are following. I have told you, we did not open interest account. No. But if there was an accrued interest, I would have opened. I would have brought down my accrued interest by the beginning, carried down the amount, Whatever is the charge for the year, I charge. Then the balancing figure is what I paid. But for this question, the opening balance is zero. The carrying down balance is zero. But the charge for the year is 600. So you must have paid exactly the same 600. I hope you have got that point. Bring it now. I hope you have got that point. So that information was a bit hidden in the sense that the examiner did not tell you direct that we paid interest of 600. But you should have known. Because that is something you should have learned even in financial accounting and also in financial reporting. So you minus. Good. I think I'm now through. Listen, I think I'm now through with the financing activities. Good. I have picked the financing items. For this question, there was shares and debentures. There was nothing like loan. Once I pick the financing item, the major, I pay the returns to the financiers. I hope you are getting, I pay the returns to the financiers. The returns are shareholders, pay them dividends. In a group company question, you pay dividends to group members and also to the non-controlling shareholders. Then you pay the interest. Good. So let's get the net now. Let's get the net. I push it to the extreme now. I take that 600, no, it's 400, sorry, it's 400 plus 640 plus, not plus, minus 888 minus 40 minus 600. I'm remaining with a negative 488, negative 488, negative. If it's a negative, we said you call it net cash outflow. Net cash outflow from financing. Net cash outflow from financing activities. Net cash outflow from financing activities. Good. Then we get the net of the three categories now. You get the net of the three categories now. Good. So let's get the operating, we get the investing, and we get the financing. Good. Our operating, I can see it up there, 17.84 plus. Our investing is a negative, I minus 17.84 minus 7.84. Then if financing, is another negative 488 I minus 488. I'm remaining with a balance of 515 positive. 512, sorry, positive. I call it increase in cash and cash equivalent. Increase in cash and cash equivalent. Increase in cash and cash equivalent. Then I told you, you add your opening cash and cash equivalent. You add your opening cash and cash equivalent. So let's go to the balance sheet last year and pick whatever closing cash and cash equivalent that were there. From the balance sheet last year, how much was the closing cash and cash equivalent? Good. If you look at the balance sheet last year, 2014, cash and cash equivalent is the among current assets. I told you that financial asset is a cash equivalent. 
financial asset is a cash equivalent last year it's a dash this year last year for cash 8 million listen 8 million but i do hope you have not forgotten that among the current liabilities there was an overdraft it's part of cash equivalent get the point that last year financial assets zero cash eight what about the bank overdraft down there i can see an overdraft of seven eight four so cash is eight million overdraft is 784 so i bring down the opening so i come and get it this way eight minus 784 our cash is 8 million. Our overdraft is a negative 784. What does it give me? What does it give me? Looks like a negative what? 8 minus 784. It gives me a negative 776. Negative. What do I get? I minus from 512. I am getting negative 264. I am getting negative 264. That 264 is what we are calling closing cash and cash equivalent. Closing cash and cash equivalent. We need to confirm that it's agreeing. We need to confirm that it is agreeing with our closing cash and cash equivalent. Let's confirm whether it's agreeing with our closing cash and cash equivalent. Good. From the balance sheet this year, what do we have? From the balance sheet this year, what do we have? I can see, look at the cash flow, at uh, the balance sheet, among the fixed current assets, sorry, among the current assets, Kunayo financial asset 400. Are you seeing it there? And there is that cash of 16 down there there is an overdraft of 680 so financial asset 400 let me take it plus cash of 16 minus the overdraft of how much 400 is a financial asset 16 is cash what about bank overdraft 680 negative Let me confirm whether it's coming to negative 264. I take that 400 plus 16, I minus 680. Yes, it's coming to 264. Good. So our cash flow has reconciled. Now we are okay. Good. So maybe for now we can stop there. For now we can stop there tomorrow. We have early morning and evening. The normal students will attend the normal classes. We shall now do the same question. Listen, we shall now do the same question using the direct, direct method. Using the direct method. Of course, we have done majority of the workings. We don't have to repeat the workings. So it will be faster for the direct method because we have done majority of the workings. In fact, all of them, majority we are only going to do three workings. Don't forget. We said when it comes to cash flow from operating, using direct, you need cash received from customers. What other figure? You need cash received from, no, cash received from customers. You need cash paid to suppliers. And you need the cash paid for services rendered. Those are the three figures we shall have to calculate. Then we can do the cash flow. Good. So maybe for today we can stop there. Maybe for today we can stop there. We pick it up from there tomorrow. We pick it up from there tomorrow. For early morning, we have your normal early morning. For the evening, you have your normal evening class. Okay? Now, I hope there are some new students who are here today. Let me uh, talk to them. For the others who are not new, you can leave. You can leave. We don't have much for you now. If you are a new student, it's you I'm talking to you now. Maybe you are here and you would wish to continue with us for the advanced financial reporting. For the new students, I'm talking to you now. You are here and you would wish to continue with us for advanced financial reporting. Normally, as you have heard me say, we have early morning classes and we have evening classes. 
our early morning starts from 5.30 in the morning to 7 a.m. Always every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Those are the days for early morning classes. Evening, we have classes from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Okay? Now, if in case you miss a class, maybe on a Saturday you are having a function and you want to attend, does it mean that you'll miss that class? The answer is no. Listen, you can go back to the group. Our system is such a way that even if you miss a class, you can go back to the group and you can watch the video of the class that you missed. Alternatively, I could have taught you and you still feel you want to listen to the class again, you can go back and listen to that class again. Just go back to the group where the link was posted and you click on the link and you'll be able to listen to your class again. Good. Listen. Alternatively, if you're not available in the early morning, you're not available in the evening, you can also buy what we call pre-recorded videos. You can buy what we also call pre-recorded videos where you buy all the videos for the whole syllabus and then you go listen to them at your own free time at your own pace that is also available good for either of them whether a live class early morning or evening or pre-recorded we are charging four thousand shillings and we still accept payments on installment we still accept payments on installments okay good now listen again If you are interested in any one of these classes, then you can call me on this number 0722-658875. 0722-658875. Call me on that number, whichever the day, whether now or later, you can call me. Good. I've also requested, I've also requested that you, if you have not subscribed, to my youtube channel please subscribe to my youtube channels please subscribe to my youtube channel just click on that subscription button down there and you can also click on the notification bell for you to be notified whenever we are posting new videos into the youtube good now so please subscribe of course my youtube channel is called cpa joseph njuguna that's the name of the youtube channel cpa joseph Juguna. Okay. Good. Now, for some of you, you may have friends who are doing financial reporting. Tell them that we also have classes for financial reporting of the intermediate. For you, you may also have some friends doing financial accounting for foundation level, which used to be called section one. We also have the financial accounting of ATD1 and ATD2. So any of those financial accounting, we are still offering. So anybody interested in accounting paper in CPA, we are teaching it. Okay, let them call me on that number. Otherwise, have a good night. See you next time. Have a good night. Bye for now. You can chat and say bye. You can chat and say bye now. If you are a new student and you have to suck a comment to say something, you can say. Maybe you are new and you have a comment, you want to say something. You can comment on something. If you want to comment on the live chat, no problem. Otherwise, if there is no comment, see you next time. Bye. Okay. Okay, Sawa. So, so for the new students, you want to join us, please call. You will also get, by the way, you will also get the videos of all the classes that you have missed. That's obvious. You will get the videos of your previous classes. Whatever class you have missed, you will still get the videos of those classes. You will still get the videos of those classes. Bye for now. Bye.
let me close off the class for now. See you next time.